This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. He was in the midst of one of corporate America's biggest scandals. Aaron Beam is the former CFO of Health South Corporation, and he's on this edition of Conversations. The 1990s were a transformational time in the business world. Technology was disrupting business as usual, and opportunities seemed endless. CEOs became rock stars, and Wall Street was suddenly more glamorous than Hollywood. As the great investor Warren Buffett once said, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. You'll remember the naked swimmers, names like WorldCom, Enron, and Health South Corporation. Aaron Beam was at the heart of the Health South scandal. As a former CFO and co-founder, his actions ultimately landed him in jail. Today, his life is much different. As a speaker and writer, he is using his unfortunate experience to educate others. From universities to corporations, Beam is spreading his ethics first message. He is the author of Ethics Playbook, Winning Ethically in Business, and Health South, The Wagon to Disaster. We welcome Aaron Beam to this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Interesting story. Tell me, how did you first get involved with Health South? Well, I actually worked for Richard Scrushy, one of the other key founders in Houston for four years before we started uh, Health South. Our company there got bought out. We raised some venture capital. And uh, Richard really was the visionary. He, he wanted to start a company that would lower health care costs by doing things outpatient. Mm -hmm. So we, we got backed and we opened chain of outpatient rehabilitation centers. And that's how it all started. And that began in Birmingham, Alabama? Is in that Birmingham uh, in 84. We opened our first center in 84. And within two years, we were a public company. So it was a, a rapid rocket rise, so to speak, after after you opened the first first couple ones. It really was because our timing was perfect. It was the cost of health care was front page news. Everybody was trying to come up with ways to lower health care costs. And technology was changing and it was getting to the point where things could be done outside the hospital. Outpatient surgery, rehabilitation could all be done outside the hospital at a much lower cost. And that's what really drove our company to come very large. Yeah. Take me through the transition when you initially went public. What was that like? Well, it's very exciting. I think in many ways, there's not much you can do in business that's more exciting. I mean, being on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, ringing the bell, you're the first trade of the day, and you're a public company on the New York Stock Exchange, it's very exciting. And it's all part of kind of how you get, you lose your focus morally and everything because you you are now kind of a rock star. It's, it's like you, in the NFL, you know, when you make it to the NFL, it's a big deal. Right. When you get on the New York Stock Exchange, it's a big deal. Right. And I'm assuming as one of the co-founders, your pocketbook was probably fattened up uh, quite quickly as well. Sure, and yeah. when I started the company, I had no net worth, nothing. Right. And you know, I was a millionaire several times over. Right, right. So take me kind of through the, the process. So once you started, uh, once you became a public company, things I get, I'm, I'm assuming continue along rather well. Where, where did things begin to break down? Well, it really was a matter of over-promising Wall Street what we could deliver. Um, Richard Scrushy in particular wanted to be a billionaire. Mm -hmm. And he had given himself millions of options. And he wanted to get, always keep the stock price up. So he literally would meet with the analysts with the investment banking firms every year and ask them, what do we need to earn next year for you to keep a strong buy on our stock? Mm -hmm. And they would tell him and he would always say, we can do that. The problem was over time, it became difficult to deliver what Scrushy was promising. And uh, it wasn't like we were doing badly, we were doing very well. Right. Uh, we weren't in trouble. Um, a lot of the frauds do start, uh, like WorldCom, because of the communication business cratered. But our business was very good. But um, we had trouble meeting earnings estimates. We started doing some, I call it aggress aggressive accounting. It was, sh I think, short of fraud because we disclosed what we were doing. But it wasn't really good accounting. Right. 
But in the summer of 1996, after being in public company for 10 years and never missing earnings, we had missed them very badly. And uh, Bill Owens, my controller, and I felt like we couldn't play with the numbers anymore. And we went into Richard's office and told him we had to report a bad quarter. And he screamed at us and he said, no, no, get out of my office. We're not going to report a bad quarter. You guys have gotten lazy. Get back in your office and fix these numbers. And that's how it all began. We succumbed, succumbed to his pressure to, he just said, you can't do it. We've got to give Wall Street good numbers. And we literally cooked the books that first time in the summer of 1996. Did you guys give him any pushback at all initially? Or? No, R Richard's a very forceful kind of guy. And he, he, over the years, he had sort of trained us all to be yes men. I'm not proud of that, but I mean, he, he totally controlled his board of directors. He was just that kind of person. He made it so unpleasant. If you ever disagreed with him, over time, you just learned to always <laughs> say yes. And it's sad, but that's... Uh, I didn't have the courage to stand up to him, and uh, pushing on him was, was not much fun, trust me. <laughs> Did you think about just saying the heck with it and walking out the door? You know, it was the right time for the quarterly report to be filed. It was supposed to be filed the next day, and or within two days, and it wasn't like he said, you know, you guys go home and think about this. So it all happened just bang, bang. And after you did it, what were you thinking? What an idiot. <laughs> what have I done? I mean, I went home that night and I told my wife. She told me how stupid I was. And I, and I was just like, I couldn't go to sleep. What what have I done? You know, I've committed major securities fraud. Right. And so from that day forward, my life was really a mess. I, I've, I've probably started drinking more than I should. I didn't like going to work. I felt trapped, and uh, within a year, I, I just left the company. I just said, I'm out of here. Talk to me about after you did it. So you you do the deed, uh, and, and you get through the analyst calls with Wall Street, right. and and so what, what was it like after that? What was the, the days following that like with Scrooge and with the rest of the it, team? It became very bizarre, very dark, very not fun. Prior to that, making those numbers and knowing when the stock went up, you were making a lot of money. Was it was it was good times, right. and but now it was like very grim. I mean, really, uh, morale went down with everybody involved, and uh, we all knew we'd gotten ourselves into a terrible mess, including Scrooge. He knew it. Oh yeah, he knew. <laughs> Certainly, he knew. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but what I'm saying is, it was it registering with him. I, I, it's hard for me to say. Uh, he, he he today says he did not know about it. He says, I, I, I'm, Beam and all those other guys are lying. I, 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 don't, I didn't know they cooked the books. And of course, ultimately, there was some regulation that ended up coming out of the things that happened at WorldCom and with you, know, you guys. Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really how the whistle got blown. Uh, I left in 97. In 2003, uh, Weston Smith, the CFO at the time, uh, called the FBI because the Zorbanks actually had just been passed, and he realized that if he signed the documents, he was going to go to prison for a much longer length of time than he would have otherwise. Right. So Zorbanks actually did bring about the, the whistleblowing of the fraud. Right. And so you're out of the company at this point. So what I'm did, gone. Okay. Yeah. So what did you do when you left? What was your? I, I moved to South Alabama. Moved to Fairhope, Alabama. And um, when I first retired, every time my doorbell rang or the phone rang, I thought it was the FBI. But oh, so much time passed. I mean, ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one, two thousand two. But I I heard, turned on my TV, uh, channel fifteen out of Mobile in. March 19th of 2003, and the announcer said, we opened tonight's news with a breaking story out of Birmingham, Alabama. Massive accounting fraud uncovered at HealthSouth. I, I, I might have just kind of passed out. It was, it was terrible. I had gotten to the point, because so much time had passed, that I, and I, of course I'd 
very much wanted to believe the fraud had stopped and I had dodged a bullet, but that wasn't the case. It just kept going. Just kept going, yeah, yeah. after I left. So how long after that news report did you, was the FBI in contact with you? No, they weren't, but the uh, attorney with the federal government in the Wall Street Journal and all the publications the next day said that several people had come forward. We know of other people that were involved and they should come forward. And I thought the next sentence was gonna be, Aaron Beam, give us a call. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't waste any time. I, called around and hired a criminal attorney the next day. And um, he called the feds and he called me back and said, oh yeah, they want to talk to you. He said, be in my office at eight o'clock in the morning. So, so then the feds come in, I'm assuming. Well, he, he three days later, he had set up a meeting in Birmingham in a federal building. And I'm sitting across the table from two FBI agents, two agents from the SEC and that's not the Southeastern Conference, right, SEC. Right, right, Securities Exchange Committee. Yeah, yeah, several attorneys from the federal government, and I'm under oath, it's tape recorded, and I just, my attorney said, do not lie to me, do not lie to the federal government. He says, your former employees have told them you were involved. The FBI has seized the Health South building. If you try to lie your way out of this, you'll go to prison for a long time. So I just, they, the FBI just sat there and asked me, Tell us what happened. And they just went down a list of people. Did Richard Scrushy know? Did so-and-so know? Did so-and-so know? And if I knew that they really had been involved in the fraud, I said yes. I wasn't going to try to protect anybody because right. then I'd be committing another crime right. by lying to the federal government. So I... Um, you gave your testimony. I gave my testimony. And I did not have to go to trial. I pled guilty that day. You pled guilty that day in yeah, Birmingham? Yeah, okay. so it, it's not a matter of me going to trial. I'm just waiting to be sentenced. But they wouldn't sentence me until the Scrushy trial was over. And it didn't begin for two years. So from 03 to 05, I had two years that were very dark. I, my wife and I knew I could go to prison 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Health South stock had gone down to eight cents a share. So my attorney said, look, the government's going to take restitution against you. They're going to look at your personal balance sheet, and they're going to take nearly all of it. He said, they're not going to put you in a box underneath the freeway, but you won't have your 25-acre estate that you have now. You won't be driving an expensive BMW like you do today. And he said, you need to be prepared to deal with that. Now, during that two-year period, Richard Scrushy did some really bizarre things. Mm -hmm. He... he, he um, left the church he'd been attending, joined an inner city church, and he gave that church a million dollars. Then he purchased a small television station in Birmingham, and every morning at 8 o'clock he began preaching the gospel on television. <laughs> he spent $20 million on his lawyers. He never entered the courtroom without a Bible in his hand. And the trial lasted uh, six months, and the jury deliberated six weeks, and he was found not guilty. And when the newspaper interviewed some of the jurors, they said, how with 17 people all testifying under oath that Mr. Scrushy is the center of the fraud, how did you find him not guilty? And some of the jurors said, those CFOs seem like liars, and Mr. Scrushy seemed like a nice Christian man. His defense attorneys did an unbelievable job. Right. He was found not guilty of all charges. Have you spoken with him since? No. Okay. No. So after that, you're, you're sent to jail. I sent to jail. Just and three months, which I'm, I'm fortunate that I got such a light sentence, but only three months. And, and what was that experience like for you? That's probably the most life-changing event other than something medical or something like that that you can go through. I mean, here I was, the CFO of a Fortune 500 company, and now I'm in prison. I've got three sets of clothes. They tell me when to go to bed, when to get up, when to go eat. It, it's very humbling, and it, and it really makes you realize, hey, it's a new world. <laughs> yeah. And I got out of prison, and I was a felon. I'm a felon today. I will be known as a felon the rest of my life. I couldn't get a job. Uh, I mowed lawns for three years. Mowed lawns? So mowed lawns. Just, it was, just like residential cutting yeah, and grass. Oh, yeah, because I couldn't get a job. 
And uh, it was kind of interesting. Sometimes a client would figure out who I was, and they, they, at the end of the day, they'd say, were you really the CFO of a Fortune 500 company? Now you mow lawns? And I'd have to t explain to them. But after doing that for three years, I, I first spoke at LSU, my alma mater. And by now, the subprime debacle had happened. And universities were scrambling to teach ethics. You had Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, the subprime debacle, Bernie Madoff. Yeah. The cover of Time magazine was why Main Street hates Wall Street. So fortunately, uh, uh, universities in civic groups and CPAs and hospital companies started hiring me to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And I had written the book, Hell South, The Wagon to Disaster, which was my first book, and it's what, how the fraud happened at Hell South, mm -hmm. uh, my brief story today. Right. And then, then, after about four years of speaking, I discovered that people wanted to know more, not just the story, but how do you build ethical strength? What In Q&A, people would say, well, when did you cross the line? What can you tell us to keep us from getting caught up in something like you did? And that's what Ethics Playbook is about. And, 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 and what did you tell them? Well, first off, books don't cook themselves. People do it. Mm -hmm. You have to look at human beings and why they do these kinds of things. Most people really aren't evil, bad people, sociopaths. So most of these crimes are really committed by people who are what you think of as good people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And keep in mind, when a fraud gets as big as Enron or Hell South, hundreds of people are involved. And lots of people don't do the job. Their board right. directors don't do their job. The auditors don't do their job. The SEC doesn't do the job. Stem Moody's and Standard & Poor's doesn't do their job. Rank and file employees don't blow the whistle. So you have to understand what causes people to behave the way they do in these things. And it, it, it took me a lot of research. You know? Now, there typically is a leader of the fraud, the guy you think of as Bernie Evers or Ken Lay or Richard Scrushy. And they're interesting people. If you study their personality, they're very charismatic. They can, they're good leaders because they can get people to follow them, either through their charm or intimidation. But they also have one thing in common for sure. What's that? They measure success by how much money they can accumulate. So there is a greed factor there. Those people, it's the dollar that's important to them. Ethics doesn't mean anything. It's money. Mm -hmm. It's the money. But then you have people typically like the CFOs. And studies show that most big frauds are started by the CEO, not the CFO. CFOs get involved sort of because you look at, accounting type people and they're uh, backroom people. They don't want to be salesmen. They don't want to be out front. Mm -hmm. And they learn and they're trained and manipulated over time to make the numbers sing, so to speak. Right. And over time you begin to compromise what you, your principles that you learned in college and you start fooling around with the numbers. Boards of directors sometimes in the past there were good old boy clubs. Mm -hmm. The guy in the center plays golf with them. They're his buddies. Um, the other thing about all, these are fiduciaries. All these people like boards of directors, outside auditors, SEC, they're supposed to look out for the public, right. not the company. But here's the big elephant in the room. Who pays them? Right. They're all paid by the company. And over time, you become loyal to the person that cuts your check. Mm -hmm. And that that's a big part of why Enron's auditors didn't do their job. I'm not going to say Hell South auditors because I wasn't there when the majority of the fraud happened, and I'm not going to talk about what I don't know about. Right, I don't. Right. I don't know. But but studies show that over time, there's a, that's a basic conflict of interest, mm -hmm. and and it can can be a problem. Do you think the regulation that has been passed in recent years, Sarbanes actually being what it, some of that, do you think that is is good? Um, or, or is it, uh, you know, you, you, get, you get people say, well, we've got too much regulation, yeah. so how do you balance? You have to have it. The public reacts, Congress wants to react, somebody wants to do something about these problems, so they pass laws. Right. There's stopgap 
they do bring, every law brings with it lots of good federal government regulation. It's very expensive. The way you really fix it is you change the culture. You have to, today, every major university is teaching ethics. Every company has a corporate compliance officer, and it's very different. Every company has a, a hotline that employees can call. So over time, you have to change the business culture. It's, um, it's kind of like smoking. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, more than half the population smoked. You can't watch two minutes of a Turner Classic movie that somebody doesn't offer somebody a cigarette. Smoke, yeah. Didn't outlaw cigarettes, but when the Surgeon General 51 years ago said it caused cancer and emphysema, over time people started changing. Mm -hmm. Today you can get on an airplane and check into a hotel room and it doesn't smell like an ashtray. We've got to change our business culture to put ethics first, to wrap everything you do with ethics and realize that any compromising of your ethics is a first step on the slippery slope. And you have to really, it takes courage to be ethical, it takes hard work, but uh, you don't teach people right from wrong. Most people know right from wrong, but you have to be trained on how to be ethical. And like I say, it, it takes hard work, it takes discipline to always do the right thing. And, and I think we're getting better. If I'm a business owner, if I'm a high level manager and I'm looking to hire people, what do you, what do you look for in that initial process that could hopefully tell you how this person's going to behave in questionable situations? Well, here's what Warren Buffett says. He says when you hire people, they should have integrity they should be intelligent, and they should have a lot of drive. But once you hire them, if you discover they don't have integrity, you better hope they're stupid and lazy. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> That's a very good point. But how do you determine early you, on if someone has integrity? Well, just, just by the interview process and uh, Maybe their track record, you got a lot of social media now. <laughs> they may tip their hand through social media that they're not mm -hmm. ethical. Or, uh, but you don't know for sure. You, don't, yeah. you really don't know for sure. And the same thing for the employee. How does the employee going to work for a company avoid an Enron or a Health South? Right. They need to do their due diligence on the company. And I tell students they should ask, if they're in accounting, they should ask, what is what are the corporate compliance policies here at this company? And if the company doesn't like you asking about those kind of things, maybe you don't want to go to work for that company. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. And the key thing is once you do know you've hired somebody that doesn't have integrity, don't give them chance after chance after chance. Yeah. Deal with them swiftly and get them out of the company. Yeah. How do you think as a society we got, and, and, and like you said, I, I, I do think we're getting better. I think it is more yeah. at the forefront, but, but we certainly went through a stage, the 90s being part of that, the early part of 2000. How do you think we got to that point to begin with? Because it's the greatest country ever. I mean, we're yeah. founded on you know honesty, integrity, and hard work. And you know, a lot of it is some of these CEOs are put on pedestals and they're treated like star athletes and you see it Occasionally, a star athlete will do something really bad. He'll beat his girlfriend up. And in the past, we may have tolerated that. But I think, you know, when, when the people at the very top in a big company, they've made stockholders millions of money. Fortune magazine voted Enron as the best company in the United States three years in a row. Their CFO was voted as the best CFO in the world. And they were, they were really bad at what they did. So it's a part of it's part of that putting people on, and uh, I also think the Kardashians are part of the problem. I can't prove it, <laughs> but <laughs> the Kardashians it, are what again? part of the problem? Oh, part of the problem. I got it, you. We put them on pedestals. We think they're great. Uh, uh, yeah. For why I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's yeah. a it's a slippage in our values. Yeah, and, and you know you bring something up. Uh, talking about Fortune magazine and, 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 and I just wonder if because of money issues and technology changing that journalism is not as good as it used to be uh, and therefore you don't have great yeah. investigative journalism and, I bet you're right about and, that. And, yeah. and, and 
There was a, a young lady, and I'm drawing a blank on her last name, Bethany was her first name, who was a tremendous journalist, who sort of uncovered the Enron uh, uh, ordeal and, and yeah. was very um, apprehensive about it and caught all kinds of negative feedback, yeah. and I apologize for missing her last name. But Cynthia she's, Cooper did, disclosed the uh, WorldCom, and then I can't think of the lady at Enron, but there were three of them. They were the cover of Time Magazine mm -hmm. as Women of the Year when they yeah. all blew the whistle. Yeah. But uh, you're probably right. It's probably, uh, that's part of it. Yeah. Also, the, um, it, it's just a fact that companies are so big now, so complex. There's people that actually say, professors in college say, it's almost impossible to really audit mm -hmm. a giant, giant, multi-billion dollar company. You, yeah. you really can't do it. It's yeah. just, they're just too big. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Yeah, your, your, your advice for a young person, uh, fresh out of college, uh, headed into the business world. You've been there, you've been to the top of the mountain, you've been to the bottom, what, what's your advice? The key thing is uh, a quote by St. Augustine in 400 AD, complete abstinence is better than perfect moderation. What he was saying, it's easier to try to be perfect than to be a little bit wrong. What is the right moderate amount of texting while you're driving is zero. Mm -hmm. The right moderate amount of cheating on your taxes, zero. The right moderate amount of cooking your books is zero. So what you have to tell people, try to be perfect when it comes to ethics. Don't set the bar a little lower and rationalize a little bit of cheating is okay. Because as soon as you set that bar a little lower, you're already on the slippery slope. It's real simple. Try to be perfect. Don't cheat any. Great advice. <laughs> Great advice. Aaron Beam, what a nice pleasure to meet you. Okay. I wish you the best of luck. Aaron Beam, the name of the book, Ethics Playbook, Winning Ethically in Business. And he also wrote Help South, The Wagon to Disaster. Interesting story. By the way, Aaron's website is AaronBeam.net. You can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.